Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us for this latest episode of Conservative Home Live. I'm Mark Wallace, the Chief Executive of Conservative Home, and we're extremely fortunate to be joined this evening by the Australian High Commissioner to the United Kingdom, George Brandis, um, a very experienced politician in his own country, at a very senior ministerial level, uh, QC by professional background, and now Australia's representative to the United Kingdom at this crucial time in the relationship between the two countries. Um, before I begin our conversation, um, uh, which I think George is going to open with, with some opening remarks, um, just to say a few house rules as ever. If you would like to submit a question for me to uh, put to the High Commissioner, pop it in the Q&A box, and I will take a look at them and mix those into the conversation as we go along. Um, there'll be uh, the, the opportunity to do that right throughout the event. We'll be running up until eight o'clock. Um, and I should say at this point also um, a vote of thanks as ever to our generous sponsor, Thorncliffe, who make these events possible and make it possible to provide them for free to you, our Conservative Home audience. Um, Hi, Commissioner. Welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us. And um, over to you for some, some opening remarks. Well, uh, thank you very much indeed, Mark. It's a great pleasure to be with you and... Uh... Uh, with the audience at Conservative Home Live this evening. Uh, it's a very auspicious day for the United Kingdom with the uh, release today of the Integrated Review. And I think that uh, when one looks at the Integrated Review, which I've been studying this afternoon, one is reminded yet again of two things. First of all, what an inflection point in modern British history this is and this period of time is uh, in the post-Brexit time as Britain redefines its role in the world. But secondly, um, how important in redefining its role in the world it is to cleave closest to old and enduring partners. And there are no, uh, clo uh, Britain has no um, closer and more trusted partner, I dare say, than Australia. And that is a, a feeling that is reciprocated. There was a, a, an opinion poll conducted by our leading international relations think tank in Australia last year of public attitudes uh, on a range of foreign policy issues. And one of the questions that was asked was, which country do you trust the most? Um, and for the fifth year in a row since the survey has been run, um, Britain was regarded by Australians as the country which they trusted most. Some 87% of Australians um, scored Britain as a trustworthy country. Um, so the, the closeness of the relationship isn't merely an historical fact, it's a present reality, and it's sustained both by the reality of global politics, but also by the confidence and trust that our peoples have in one another. And finally, I might say it doesn't do any harm at all that the governments of both countries are uh, safely and securely in the hands of centre-right governments, the government of Boris Johnson here and the government of Scott Morrison uh, in Australia. So that political consanguinity uh, uh, is, is yet another layer uh, over the, um, the, the, the consanguinity between peoples, uh, the shared values, the shared, the common interests, the, the common institutions, and of course our shared history. So uh, Australians uh, feel nothing but affection uh, and, uh, for the people of the United Kingdom. We feel that warmly reciprocated uh, and uh, our Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, very much appreciates the invitation uh, to attend the G7 um, in Carbis Bay in June, and we look forward to welcoming him then. Well, thank you very much. And I think you, you've touched there on several um, essential points, really, that a lot of our viewers will, will recall came up as well in our recent event with Liz Truss, when this question of the United Kingdom, of course, for the first time in decades, finding itself with a very new and different role in terms of its trade policy and uh, remodelling its alliances, um, uh, and, and, and as you say today, announcing its new um, strategic plans for, for, for the coming years and decades. Hence, it's so important to be having this conversation uh, this evening. Can I ask, in terms of that change that's happening to the United Kingdom, in terms of Brexit having been done, the UK being outside the EU, from, from Australia, what, what's the view of the UK actually undertaking Brexit? And to what extent, as somebody who's a very close observer of events in this country, to what extent do you feel there's a kind of widespread understanding 
back home of, of, of what the UK is doing and why? Well, we in Australia, we're agnostic on the question of Brexit. Um, the, it, we regarded it as entirely a matter for the British people. But I must say, Mark, um, speaking for myself, that I completely understand why uh, the decision was made to leave the European Union. And the corollary, I think, of that decision <clears throat> is what, uh, in part what we saw today, the, the, the uh, Britain resuming a place, a, a role of global, but rather merely regional leadership in the world, which Australia respects and wants to cooperate with you in, as you uh, set out on what is a very important, I, I think, a very important um, uh, uh, turning point in your foreign policy. And from the Australian perspective as well, one of the things we talked about with, with, with Liz Truss, of course, is the UK's talks with Australia about developing a new trade uh, agreement between the two countries. Can you, can you let our listeners know where proceedings stand on that front or what, what the Australian government's hoping to uh, secure with, with regard to that? Yes, I can. So uh, there is a great deal of uh, enthusiasm uh, in both countries, in both governments, for a free trade agreement between us. Um, now, the free trade agreement negotiations were launched in the middle of last year. Uh, ordinarily, of course, they would have uh, taken place face to face. Um, that hasn't been possible. So they have been proceeding uh, under the constraints of um, uh, um, having to be done virtually and at awkward times, which have slowed things down a little. There have been four negotiating rounds so far. The, the most recent concluded um, the week before last, and there have been intercessional rounds as well. Um, as well as that, Liz and I, who have become good friends, speak very frequently about this. In fact, we're speaking again um, on Friday. Um, the, the, we're quite pleased with the way the negotiations are going. Uh, trade deals, uh, trade agreements are enormously complex because they have to cover uh, vast areas of the economy, um, all of which is subject to different regulations in both countries, which need to be harmonised and aligned. And there's the added complication with Australia, of course, that we're a federal system. And a lot of the, um, the relevant law as a, a regulatory framework uh, re require the uh, cooperation of the state governments as well. So this is not going to be easy in a, in a, in a, in, Methodically, it's not going to be easy because it's so complex. But the outcome that we are seeking to achieve, having an ambitious and comprehensive free trade agreement between our two countries, uh, is a clear one uh, in the minds of both governments. And we believe we'll get there. I'm going to bring in a question now from one of our listeners at home, Jeff Townsend. Thank you for your question. Um, he asks... Which industrial sectors do you see as central to future engagement between our nations? Well, I think really across the entire economy, um, if the free trade agreement is comprehensive and ambitious enough, which we hope it will be, then uh, it will really have effects across all sectors. But uh, there are uh, three that are that are foreground. Um, first of all, services. Um, the uh, the uh, red, red, uh, red, readier access of both countries' markets to, the, to each other's services economies is a very big deal in this free trade agreement, whether it be professional services, educational services, financial services, business services, that's a very big part. Um, from Australia's point of view, uh, commodities, um, we are a major commodities exporter, particularly agricultural commodities. We produce three times more than we consume. We're one of the world's great commod uh, agricultural commodities exporters. And uh, we um, are saying to our friends in the United Kingdom that uh, you know, we don't want to have to refight the, the repeal of the Corn Laws here. We, 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 ex we expect a, a Tory government to, to, uh, to embrace the principle of free trade, and which means, of course, greater choice and, 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 uh, and, um, and uh, better uh, provision for your consumers. And um, looking at an area where Brit uh, the British economy is more concentrated than the Australian economy, advanced manufacturers, uh, there is a huge demand uh, in Australia uh, for high-end advanced manufacturers, which, uh, as I say, is a, a more salient feature of the UK economy than it is of the Australian economy. And there are huge opportunities 
for UK manufacturers, particularly high end, uh, high tech manufacturers uh, in this FTA. With regard to agriculture that you, that you just mentioned, you'll be aware, obviously, this is a hot topic in uh, within UK politics, including in various, um, particularly rural conservative seats. Are you are you concerned by some of the pushback against um, kind of opening up of agricultural trades within the UK? And and is that something that you're yourself kind of in, in, engaged with discussing with the, the groups involved? Well. Look, we understand that this is a period, a difficult period of adjustment for all sectors of the UK economy coming out of Europe and the agricultural sector uh, in well, some elements thereof feel particularly exposed. We understand that. But we also um, draw from our own experience in Australia where we went through this exercise 30 years ago. I'm old enough to remember the concerns uh, that were expressed um, from our uh, agricultural producers and farmers at the time. And the experience, uh, the lived experience in, of Australia in the, in the decades since has been that free trade generates prosperity. Sometimes there are adjustment issues and they can be accommodated by phasing in periods, for example. But in the end, and if conservatives don't believe this, then nobody will. But, and you should, it should be engraved on your heart. Free trade generates prosperity. And with regard to another aspect of the, the, the forthcoming, hopefully forthcoming free trade agreement, what's Australia's attitude to, to things like uh, visa access and free or, or even free movement of people with the United Kingdom? Because like, it's fair to say that one aspect of our relationship where a lot of people in the UK and a lot of people in Australia found it quite frustrating, I think, during our years of EU membership, that as a result of, to a certain extent, as a result of, open borders with the EU, the UK has been very restrictive to migration from a lot of people um, in, uh, in, in, from its close allies and, and members of the Commonwealth like Australia. Well, it was a, a source of um, some um, irritation, I must say, to Australia, particularly Australian tourists who would find themselves queuing for, you know, sometimes for hours at Heathrow, for example, um, when uh, EU citizens didn't have to do that. Um, but that has now been fixed. I mean, that no longer happens. And Australians and New Zealanders and others have access to the passport gates. So that was a reform introduced only in the last couple of years. Um, more broadly, on the question of the mobility of people, that is part of these discussions. And there are two areas in which uh, we are both um, very eager to see um, significant um, liberal liberalisation. Uh, one is with youth mobility so that the opportunities for younger people to, to live and, and to work for a, a long period of time in each other's countries um, uh, is one thing that we are looking at. And the other is business mobility and uh, mobility of professional people and business people so that they can also, with less restraint than exists at the moment, um, live and work in uh, each other's countries. Now, now I, I, Mark, for reasons you'll understand, this is a, this is a, a current negotiation. So. I can't speak more than in generalities, but we are, I, I think it's fair to, well, I know it's, it's, it's the case that, uh, that both governments are very eager to see um, significant liberalisation in those areas. And how about, um, are, are you able to comment on the, the UK's application uh, recently submitted to join CPTPP? Obviously that, presumably that would, um, if successful, would help to uh, would, would effectively either replicate or, or, or alternatively preempt some of the, the basis for a, a UK Australia FTA. Well, as a founding member of the CPTPP, um, Australia uh, is supporting Britain's application to join the C to accede to the CPTPP. Um, I should point out that the CPTPP at, at the moment is a plurilateral uh, trade agreement between eleven nations. It is not. I mean. We talk, we talk in, in general about free trade agreements, but there are some are more liberal than others. The bilateral uh, FTA that Australia and the United Kingdom are seeking to, to uh, achieve uh, is going to uh, be much more liberal than the CPTPP, of course. But notwithstanding that, it is very much in Britain's interest to accede to the CPTPP, and we support your aspiration to do so.
Thank you. Uh, much, much appreciated. One of, the, one of the things we've seen in, in UK, the development of UK trade policy since we regained a fully independent trade policy by leaving the EU is the way that the UK government has looked to close allies like Australia and New Zealand with their own extensive experience of of, of uh, establishing their own bilateral trade relationships um, to help guide our country in in some ways relearning uh, a skill that's withered on the vine a little bit. The question of negotiating, the question of navigating some of these institutions during the decades in which the UK's trade policy was effectively outsourced to Brussels. Um, are there any tips effectively? What, what would your advice be from your experience, from Australia's experience, in to, to the UK in how to uh, how to navigate this system for a country which simply isn't used to doing so. Well, look, I, I think what the what negotiators are engaged in is a highly technical skill, and it's certainly true that Australia um, has had that uh, body of, um, of knowledge and experience for a long time now. Um, but uh, I, I don't feel I, I'm not going to, as it were. Uh, critique um, the performance or conduct of, of your negotiators. Uh, but can I just make this point, uh, uh, this somewhat broader point? Learn from the experience of Australia about how beneficial free trade agreements are. When the government of Tony Abbott, of which I was a member, was elected in 2013, we embarked on a vigorous, very vigorous um, prosecution of free trade agreements. Um, in 2013, 26% of our exports were to countries with which we had free or preferential trade agreements. Today, it's over 70%. And that's not including the, 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 uh, the uh, negotiations underway with the United Kingdom, or indeed, the negotiations we have in parallel underway with the European Union as well. And that you what you what you will you will barely find anyone in Australia. You might find the odd dinosaur trade union leader, but apart from um, people like that, you'll barely find anyone in Australia who doesn't think that that has been a good thing. It's one of the reasons Australia um, has been has has become such a prosperous society because we have freed up our economy domestically, and we have freed up our economy and our markets internationally. And I think I'm right in saying that a former colleague of yours has recently become Secretary General of the OECD. How important is it the, for, for the country to secure representation at high levels in international or multinational organisations? Well, indeed, that's true. Uh, my uh, former parliamentary and cabinet colleague and friend, Senator Matthias Cormann, was on Friday elected as the new Secretary General of the OECD. And that is... Um, I think that's a great thing for Australia because it's the most high level international body that Australia will have led for many years. Since um, about 20 years ago, um, Australia was uh, head of the World Bank. Um, but also Matthias Cormann, um, who was our longest serving finance minister, is a hugely capable person, uh, reliably conservative, not at all woke, um, somebody who uh, is a pragmatic man who uh, will bring a finance minister's mind and discipline to the OECD. Uh, and uh, he, he will be based in Paris. He will no doubt visit London very often. And I look forward to, Mark, introducing him to you and, uh, and uh, other Conservatives. Well, we certainly look forward to that, to that too. Um, I'm going to bring in another um, audience member's question. Um, as an audience member uh, asking uh, anonymously, um, what is your standing about Kanzuk? That's for, for listeners not associated, uh, acquainted with that, the idea of Canada, Australia, New Zealand and the UK as a, 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 an alliance uh, globally. Um, and this listener asks, if positive, how much are the UK and Australia working at it? Could we do more and shall we? Well, look, this uh, idea of there being a closer integration between Canada, New Zealand, the United, um, uh, the United Kingdom and Australia really happens already. Um, it happens in the Commonwealth, for example, where um, we, uh, we often find ourselves um, on the same side of, uh, of, of issues. Um, it happens, of course, 
with the addition of the United States in the Five Eyes intelligence sharing community, which is much more these days than an intelligence sharing community. It's really, um, it has a lot of very important multilateral aspects beyond intelligence. But I think that there are some who speak of Kanzok um, who feel comfortable that it, it is a, a, a group of like-minded nations, which it is. But there are other like-minded nations as well um, with whom we must, um, we must have associations. Uh, Japan, for example. Japan is enormously important. Australia is a, is a partner with Japan, India, and, and the United States uh, in, a, 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 in an international um, grouping called the Quad, uh, which some have described as the Asian NATO, which I myself think is a misnomer because its purposes are not defensive in the way NATOs were, at least in, their incep in its inception. But uh, my, my message to those who ask about Council is A, to a degree that I think would satisfy you, that level of cooperation already exists. But I think it is also best to, to include rather than exclude like-minded nations in useful international endeavours. I was, I was going to ask actually related to, to the Quad, it's been floated in recent days the question of whether Australia may look to take an even more leading role within the Quad, for example, making it a more formalised uh, uh, institution as such with its own secretariat and so on. It, is that something you're able to comment on? Well, it's not something I want to, I don't want to get it ahead of the discussion. Um, it's certainly the case that the whole idea of the Quad um, uh, Australia had a great propulsive force, shall we say, in, in, in bringing the quad into being. It's something uh, we're very, uh, very committed to. Uh, and it's something that I think is taking a, uh, taking a much more concrete shape much more rapidly than it, uh, than it had at an earlier time in its, in its being. But it's, it's, it's an evolving concept. Um, the, 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 the Biden administration has... Uh, engaged uh, with us. Uh, India is more, um, more committed than, than uh, it was. There, there is less hesitancy or caution on the part of India than there was. So it's not just Australia and Japan anymore sort of driving this. It, it's, uh, it, there is a, a much greater level of commitment, I think, in my all four members. Well, I think the, the discussion, I think it's fair to say the discussion or the emergence of the Quad, um, the, the development of the D10, the, the idea of an alliance of a wider alliance of democracies, suggests that it's not just Brexit that's a change on the world stage. There's actually, we're at a time of a, a, a great movement and realignment between different countries. And particularly this idea, as you just hinted at, with, with, with the D10, the idea of a um, a kind of pole in global relations that should be focused on um, uh, the most fundamental common value of being democratic states. Um, to what extent is that something that you see potentially growing further? Um, and to what extent do you think it's driven by growing concern about you know, aggression and hostility from states like China? Well, I, 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 I don't want to speak uh, about any particular potential um, potential rival, uh, but let me just say this: historically, nations have aligned primarily by reason because they were they saw common interests in geographical proximity. Um, Britain in the nineteen from the really the about nineteen seventy from the time of um, uh, that you joined the European Union, you defined your interests in terms of geographical proximity being the, the principal driver. I think in the 21st century, when the world is so much more integrated, um, where the nation states define their interests much more globally than they ever did before, geographical proximity has ceased to be the principal driver of common interest. The great driver of common interest is common values. And those common values span the world which is why um, I think um, the, the Britain's uh, aspiration, the, 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 the whole inspiration of global Britain, which breaks out of a, a, a Euro, Eurocentric Atlanticist mindset and says that Britain has values that are important to it 
that are at, at, at as much exposed in the Indo-Pacific potentially as they are in the Atlantic. Um, and those, those interests are expressed in particular in our shared values in seeking partnerships which, with nations which share our values as liberal democracies. Um, um, need to be strengthened right across the globe. I think that is exactly the way international politics is going. Um, Australia is delighted to have been invited to uh, be an additional participant uh, uh, at the G7, uh, along with India and South Korea. Um, the democracies need to, to continue to strengthen their cooperation and integration, and they need to do that on a global scale. Uh, that brings in uh, listener Jonathan Rush. Thank you for your question, Jonathan, who, who asks, related to that, what additional measures could the UK take alongside Australia to help defend those kind of values? I, I think we, you know, we saw both countries expressing concern, um, for example, about the potential erosion of some of those principles in, say, Hong Kong, for example. Mm. Um, you know, it, 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 is there more that we can do? And is there more that we, our two nations, can do together? Well, I think the, 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 from, a dip, from a diplomatic viewpoint, uh, everything is going, it seems to me, in the right direction. Um, the amount of collaboration, for example, the joint statement that your government and, and, and ours and, and others, including the Canadians, um, made about Hong Kong uh, is, a, is an example of that. I mean, there is no two countries have greater equities in protecting uh, their citizens in Hong Kong than the United Kingdom and Australia, because you have the, the, the largest number, but Australia has the second largest number of its citizens living as expatriates in Hong Kong. So I think at a diplomatic level and in terms of military cooperation too, um, as we do in the Middle East at the moment, um, things are in, a, in very good shape, very good shape indeed. Uh, but the one area, certainly in our bilateral relationship, which um, is sort of you know, a brick in the wall that is, has been missing because of the constraints of your previous membership of the EU is trade. I mean, the, the diplomatic cooperation, military cooperation, um, uh, various other vectors of cooperation um, are important. But the, the big missing bit has been the trade piece, which we are now seeking to, uh, to, to fill. And inspired by, I think, what you said earlier, listener Rhiannon Bartlett asks, uh, the UK has made it clear today that it aims to be more engaged in the Indo-Pacific. Yeah. Can and should the UK join the Quad? Well, look, that's a discussion. That, that I mean, the Quad is relatively new, by the way. I mean, it's it, it, and it is evolving quickly. Uh, that is um, something about which um, I don't want to make a comment. I mean, it, it is whether I don't know what the UK government's mind is uh, on the matter. Um, and I think it would be premature for me to address that. Understood. Um, now, we have a question here um, from uh, some, somebody known to both of us, I think, Martin Hislop, um, who asks, um, in view of Australia and the UK's shared educational and cultural institutions and values, does His Excellency have any concern about the undermining of those values and institutions by woke and other ideological agendas? Well, hello, Martin. Um, uh, I, look, I do, I must say, I, I, I have a, a deep concern about the narrowing of the public space that is evident from the prohibition of, of, of discussion about areas that are regarded as off limits that used not to be regarded as off limits. We see that in public broadcasters. We see it in political debate more generally. And we particularly see it, uh, I'm sorry to say, certainly in, in Australia as well as in the United Kingdom, we particularly see it, uh, I'm sorry to say, in some universities, not all, but some. I mean, if ever there is an institution in society which depend upon the vigorous contestability of ideas, it is universities. So freedom of speech on a university campus seems to me to be pretty close to an absolute value. We've seen a rising concern in this country, um, <clears throat> linking together, I think, the, the topic of universities you just mentioned and the questions of um, security challenges and, and, and 
shared lessons that we mentioned earlier. We've seen a rising concern in this country, including from a lot of conservative parliamentarians in Westminster, about um, the potential security picture in higher education uh, institutions, um, among other um, sections of industry, for example, the question of a risk of penetration of important and sometimes sensitive institutions, including research institutes, by potentially representatives of hostile foreign powers. That's something I think you, you've had some experience of in Australia as well. Can you, can you share with us a little bit Australia's experience of dealing with that, that kind of issue? Well, um, let me deal with it um, in the broad and then more specifically in relation to universities. Um, one of the major um, pieces of reform I was responsible for when I was the Attorney General in Australia and under the Australian system as it was when I was the Attorney, the Attorney General um, also had responsibility for domestic national security. So the Attorney General uh, in Australia when I was in that office was a combination of your Attorney General plus your Home Secretary minus the immigration function. So let us say. Um, and we, um, uh, under the leadership of Prime Minister Turnbull, um, we reformed uh, our laws uh, in relation to foreign interference in our democracy uh, and our civil institutions, including universities. Uh, and that um, uh, those foreign interference laws are something that I know, because I've discussed it with them, that... Uh, your part, members of parliament and senior officials and indeed intelligence um, officials are very interested in and uh, I would humbly suggest that they are, they are worthy of emulation. Um, when I was doing that, I must say, I found the issue of universities particularly difficult. And, the re and there are a couple of reasons for that. First of all, and it's, a, it's sort of the other side of the coin of the observation I made before, universities depend on freedom of speech and that means freedom of of, of intellectual inquiry and research as well. Great universities, of which you have, of course, many in this country, and we have uh, many in Australia too, depend on international collaborative research partnerships. So, and, and that of necessity in, means sharing. Um, so the protection of universities from hostile foreign actors and, and, and foreign interference um, in a way that doesn't traduce or diminish, or diminish or undermine or limit their research mission is quite a difficult task. Now, that being said, uh, there are some things you can do. One, for example, is to be very wary of uh, research funding, which is tied by or limited by unacceptable conditions. Another is by the much more rigorous protection of intellectual property. Um, and the a third, which is related to the second, is the way in which particularly technology uh, and research product is uh, monetized and, and commercialized by universities so that universities are not being used as a vehicle to uh, ex exfiltrate uh, intellectual property in a, uh, but but the research product is being used for a bona fide, a scholarly and potentially a commercially marketable purpose. Now those are some of the things that 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 I, we had a seminar uh, at Australia House before COVID actually, and we had representatives from Oxford and other UK universities, and we talked we, we thrashed this out at some length, but it's it's a real problem. Uh, Foreign interference is a big problem, but the way in which you apply the principles underlying those laws to institutions like universities, as I said a moment ago, a particularly challenging one. Does it concern Australia that some of its international partners are either through, you know, willfully or accidentally somewhat naive with regard to some of the some of the states that they do business with or, or, or that they engage with on, the, on this kind of basis. I, I'm thinking um, of, you know, for, for example, states or organisations that might, might sign close investment relationships with, with, with countries that have a track record of, you know, facing troubling allegations on this front. 
It, look, it's, it's something that has to be judged on a case-by-case -case basis. I don't want to um, sort of... Under, uh, to, uh, I want to tread carefully and not make too many generalisations here, but you've identified or your uh, audience member has identified a problem and I've tried to explain some of the dimensions to that problem and some of the vectors into finding solutions to it. Understood. And so uh, switching topic a little bit, one of the questions, we, we've talked a lot about the close um, you know, ideological and uh, values-based relationship between our two countries. Obviously, we're, we're also quite literally a family of, of, of countries in, in various different ways. We've got several questions that have come in about um, actually being able, the prospect of being able to go to Australia um, for a variety of different listeners. Um, to give you a couple of examples, um, Trisha, one of our listeners, uh, says, as of uh, today, I will have received my first COVID vaccination. I have both of my children and all four of my grandchildren living in Australia, two of whom I've yet to meet as they were born during lockdown. Congratulations, Trisha. I'm desperate to see my family. Can you tell me if after I've received both vaccinations, this will be sufficient to allow me to travel to Australia and when? Well, I can't give you that assurance yet because no such decision has been made. Um, Australia has um, handled the pandemic very well. Um, there hasn't been a death from COVID in Australia this year. Um, and um, I think the total number of fatalities, uh, the most recent of which was late in December, uh, has been 909 from a population of 26 million. Um, because of that, and one of the reasons for that, I should say, is because we, we did shut our international borders very, very fast. Uh, and we introduced this regime of hotel quarantine quite early, which uh, the United Kingdom has now adopted as well. We took that in pretty draconian approach to protect our population, uh, of course. Uh, and it, it's worked. And because it has worked so well, um, there isn't, I, I don't detect a big groundswell of public opinion in Australia, frankly, to, um, to change those policy settings um, um, in the near future. Now, how long the near future is, no, who can say? Um, ultimately, um, I think that um, the question of, I mean, this begs the question of, you know, vaccine certificates or some other proof of vaccination. Uh, ultimately, I think uh, it will be the international carriers, the airlines, that will be big players in this space. Um, because if they say, if one airline says, well, we're not going to carry you unless you can produce proof of vaccination, then um, other airlines will follow. They're, I think they're bound to. Um, uh, look, I, I, I'm not... Uh, making a prediction here, but let me share, with, to give your um, uh, audience member just a, a little glimmer of hope. Let me share with you a publicly announced fact. Um, Qantas, the Australian National Airline, announced three weeks ago that it was tentatively, tentatively emphasised um, scheduling flights uh, to and from the United Kingdom, direct London, Sydney and London, Perth from October. Now, whether that, whether that is more, anything more than a placeholder in the calendar, I'm not at liberty, I, I'm not in a position to say, because I don't know, it's not that I'm not at liberty to say, I just don't know. But I have to, to be honest with you, given the, the, the wide public acceptance by Australians that the government's policies, federal and state, have been affected I think Australia, Australian governments are going to take quite a conservative and very cautious approach to, um, to uh, reducing the level of restrictions. So fair to say a few nervous months for our other listener, Chris Goddard, who says, is there any chance of us watching the Ashes live in Australia later in the year? Well, the first Ashes test is in November, I think. So uh, that's a long, uh, it's, November is a long way away. <laughs> We shall have to watch this space. And it, can you give us an insight? Obviously, in, in this country, um, having sadly had a very different um, 
experience uh, through, through suffering in the pandemic than Australia. In this country, a huge amount of focus right now, as you know, is on the rollout of the vaccination programme and how that and the effects of the vaccines will tie into um, loosening lockdown and, and how and when that will take place. Can you give us an insight into what the next steps are for Australia with regard to, for example, a, a domestic vaccination programme uh, in your country? We're, we're rolling out a vaccination programme in Australia as well. Um, uh, we were, um, the, the, that commenced about six weeks ago, um, so it was a bit later than yours, and uh, we have a similar uh, ambition to have, a, have it, uh, the, our population comprehensively vaccinated this year. And are you seeing a similar appetite for uptake, or has it made a difference, the fact that Australia hasn't seen so many cases within its borders? Look, I, I think in both the United Kingdom and Australia, you don't tend to get a lot of vaccine scepticism, not on the measure that you do in the United States and in some parts of Europe. Um, Australians are a pretty pragmatic people. And uh, I, I th- uh, my understanding is that the uptake has been very good. How is the, for that matter, was the Australian program affected by the surprise decision, I think 10, 11 days ago now by Italy to impound a planned export of AstraZeneca vaccines? Um, my understand. well, we, Australia's very disappointed about that, of course, and we made that known. Um, but I'm not aware that at the moment, at least, that that has slowed uh, because we have multiple sources of supply um, and I'm not aware that that has slowed the Australian vaccination program down in any significant way. Glad to hear it. Um, on, on to a new topic, illustrating the range of the audience for Conservative Home Live events from around the world to every possible stratum of society. We have a question from the father of the Prime Minister, uh, Stanley Johnson, um, who writes, I consider, I'm not going to do an impression, I, I thought about doing it, but I'm, I, Stanley would never forgive me. Um, I consider myself a good friend of George Brandis. He's a superb High Commissioner and a great guy, and Australia is one of my favourite countries in the world. So it is in a spirit of total friendliness, both personal and political, that I would like to put the following question question to him. More than 100 countries have joined an alliance aiming at net carbon zero by 2050 ahead of Glasgow. May we hope that Australia may seize the opportunity to join that alliance even ahead of Glasgow COP26, while announcing a clear programme for achieving that objective. Well, Mark Stanley, um, uh, who I'm very, very fond of, I must say, um, did, was kind enough to ring me on Friday to give me advance notice of that question. So thank you very much, Stanley. And uh, uh, look, this is, this is the position. Australia's goal, like the United Kingdom's goal, is to achieve net zero emissions. So the question is not about the aspiration, but the timing. The way in which our Prime Minister expressed um, Uh, that goal uh, in a major speech that he gave at the beginning of last month was this, let me quote him. Our goal is to reach net zero emissions as soon as possible and preferably by 2050. Now, as recently as yesterday, I think I haven't limited to say this, um, I was in a uh, a call between uh, Alok Sharma uh, and the Australian minister responsible, uh, Angus Taylor, And Angus um, said, uh, also a former uh, colleague of mine, said to Alok Sharma, as soon as possible, preferably by 2050, preferably sooner than 2050. Now, um, the way in which we express um, an aspiration is a function of language. What is important is that we have adopted net zero as soon as possible, which could well be before 2050. But, you know, the ambition is great, but delivery is more important. And so what Australia is concentrated on doing is demonstrating and developing policies, particularly technology-based solutions, which will enable us to get to net zero as soon as possible, and preferably by 2050, or preferably if possible, before 2050, um, as well 
Australia leads the world in um, renewables, particularly solar, uh, because we have a lot of sun in Australia, as you know. So um, solar and also um, storage um, of energy is something that Australia um, is, has advanced a very long way down the path and ahead of uh, most European uh, nations. And the third area in which Australia has been world leading, world leading has been in green, um, green finance um, and the financing of green um, um, and carbon abatement uh, projects. The spirit of the, the great John Howard still influences the modern, the modern Australian centre-right governments. And John always used to have a, a saying, always under promise and over deliver. And I think there is a bit of the spirit of John Howard in the Australian government's approach. Whatever we promise to deliver on, we will deliver. And we'll deliver sooner than you expect. And I don't think the issue of net zero by 2050 is going to be a problem. Well, from the father of the British Prime Minister to a questioner and, and, and viewer from Queensland, um, Christine Gibson Pierce, um, who writes, Ambassador Brandis, how do you reconcile the geographic location of Australia to the UK with the current UK government push to achieve zero carbon output? I, I assume uh, Christine has in mind trade and travel, not least. Well, perhaps. Um, I, well, I, I don't think that they that they are irreconcilable or inconsistent at all. I mean. But I think the question, though, does remind us of, of, of one, one thing, and that is um, every country has its own particular circumstances. Uh, and it, when it comes to energy policy, for example, we in Australia don't generate electricity from uranium, even though we have more bauxite than any nation on earth. We don't because an Australian government 40 years ago made an ethical choice that the risks of, nu uh, the, of, of nuclear waste presented such a hazard to uh, je for generations to come that we wouldn't exploit that resource. The United Kingdom hasn't made that choice and most European nations haven't made that choice. So that um, a large part of, of your energy task is provided by nuclear generation. Now I use that example to illustrate two things. First of all, um, carbon emissions abatement isn't the only ethical choice. Uh, that you can make about energy policy. But secondly, every country is different. Every country has a different energy mix. So the policy measures that it adopts have to reflect uh, that different energy mix. And are there, would you say, potential, um, uh, potential overlaps between the goal of controlling um, carbon emissions and pursuing net zero and certain security goals in terms of, say, some of those democratic nations with shared values we talked about earlier, being able to do things like reduce their energy or, or other forms of import dependency on countries which don't fall into that category? Certainly we need to ensure, I mean, that the security of energy is a core goal for every nation, whether it be a democratic nation or an undemocratic nation but because uh, it is also a point of vulnerability. So of course we have to uh, protect not only our sources, but our energy, energy infrastructure too. And that is why the Australian parliament um, in the last couple of years passed legislation to protect from foreign takeover um, Australian infrastructure, um, including electricity infrastructure, um, where we were not satisfied that the proposed takeover met a, a, a national interest criterion and we expanded the statutory definition of national interest criteria uh, to include uh, security as well as economic criteria. On, on a related note, we've got I have a question from viewer John May. That question of uh, relating, I suppose, to Australia's view on how it manages its relationships with um, large corporations and in, in, in international, becoming international forces in themselves. John asks, Facebook's stance and relationship with mainstream media has recently come under scrutiny in Australia. What do you think are the biggest issues arising from the influence and role of social media platforms? And I suppose I'd add on to that. How, uh, what kind of common lessons do you think there are for those fellow democratic nations? Well, I think 
Uh, to state the obvious, social media platforms are enormously powerful and their evolution has been so fast that the regulatory framework hasn't kept caught up with them. Um, my own experience um, in politics in Australia was that the uh, social media companies were slow, were, were, uh, were slow to accept the obligations which their power as media of communication necessarily uh, presented. Um, in particular, um, in the, um, the misuse by hostile actors of those of the dark net, the dark web, uh, and, uh, and the uh, uh, traducing of those platforms by hostile actors like uh, uh, um, white collar criminals, financial criminals, terrorists. Um, there was, in my experience, a hesitancy of, of, of sufficient response on the part of some. I think that problem is being ameliorated. I think that problem is being ameliorated. And you now it's, it's a mantra of Silicon Valley that what happens online is as much a part of reality as what happens offline or what happens in the physical, tangible world. Well, if that's the case, if that be the case, then the same degree of scrutiny and the same governance of conduct has to be accepted online as in the tangible world. Thank you. Now, I'm aware we have a few minutes left in, in this broadcast, so I'm going to try and bring in a few, um, uh, a few more audience questions, so uh, jumping around from a few different topics. Um, touching on something we talked about earlier a little, Matthew Kavanagh, who describes himself as being from Doha, Qatar, formerly Brisbane and sometimes London, um, asks, with the UK government moving on from the EU-focused Erasmus exchange and setting up the Turing scheme for uh, students, what scope is there for Australia and the UK and perhaps other like-minded countries to expand tertiary student exchange programs and scholarships for something more ambitious to rival the scope of Erasmus? Well, the, the student exchange and educational exchange is one of the things that it's one of the aspects of the greater mobility of, of, of people that we're talking about in the FTA discussions, as is the mutual recognition of professional qualifications. And um, uh, without assenting to one particular model, as Matthew was inviting me to do, certainly the, the greater exchange between our two countries, the opportunity to study as I did in the United Kingdom or for UK students to study at one of the, the great Australian universities and then have the qualifications achieved um, as a result of that course of study recognised is one of the best possible ways of binding people together. Thank you. Um, Councillor Chris Buckwell asks, does Australia support the view that the Commonwealth should encourage applications from more applicant states? Well, there are um, applica applications at the moment uh, from applicant states, um, and every one of them is to be judged on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, the next Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting um, will be in Rwanda, and uh, Rwanda will have the presidency of the Commonwealth, which means for the first time, uh, a nation that was not part of the of the old uh, or, or, or an outgrowth of, of the old British Commonwealth or the ultimately the empire um, uh, will uh, be hold, hold the presidency of the Commonwealth. And th there are 54 nations in the Commonwealth now, so about a quarter of the nations in the world. The Commonwealth has a great attractive power, and that attractive power it goes beyond nations with a British history. Or, 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 or which counted as part of their history, a time when they were British dominions or colonies. Um, and that is a good thing. It reflects the fact that there is a degree of familiarity, even though not all the nations of the Commonwealth uh, are as democratically pure or uh, 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 as we would wish them to be, uh, the Commonwealth is a force for good. And as the symbolic leader of the Commonwealth, and as the Queen, of course, is the head of the Commonwealth and the Prince of Wales is the next head of the Commonwealth designate. Um, it's, an it's also an enormous aspect of British soft power too. You mentioned uh, the, the Queen and her role in the Commonwealth. Um, listener Ian Hughes asks the inevitable question, 
what has been the effect of he capitalizes this that interview on Austrian Australian republicanism. So uh, I assume the Oprah interview. Look, I don't know. Um, it was, I think, much watched in Australia. Um, but uh, the thing you must understand about Australians' attitude, and a lot of Australians think that Australia should become a republic within the Commonwealth, but a, ma a majority do not um, think so. But what you must understand about all Australians' attitudes here is the universal respect in which the Queen uh, is held. Um, the former Prime Minister uh, of Australia, Malcolm Turnbull, who was once um, the leader of the Australian Republican movement at the time we had, had our referendum in 1999 on whether Australia should become a republic, and the decision was no, um, was asked when years later as Prime Minister, he had an audience uh, of Her Majesty, um, whether he was still a Republican. And he replied uh, very gallantly, I am an Elizabethan. Um, David McKinley asks, as a person, do you draw most satisfaction from being a lawyer, a politician or a diplomat? Well, that's, uh, that, that assumes that I can, as it were, divide myself into three. Um, uh, the, the honest answer to your question is that um, I have always been and, and still and was when I was in Parliament, first and foremost, a lawyer. Thank you. Now, you've been extremely generous with, with your time. So but before I say farewell to our audience, I, I, I think there was um, there's a forthcoming event that you're taking part in that, that you wanted to mention. Well, I, well, thank you for the opportunity for this plug, uh, Mark. But uh, there is a very fine organisation that has been formed called Conservative Friends of Australia. And I'd like to uh, take the, uh, and it's under the leadership of uh, Ed Jones, who I'm sure a lot of your audience members would know. Um, and uh, we, uh, Conservative Friends of Australia is having uh, its first big event next Monday evening at 7pm, an evening with Liz Truss and me um, in conversation. So uh, perhaps we'll be rehearsing some of the topics that, uh, particularly about the FTA that, that we've been discussing tonight, Mark. But I would encourage those um, in, among your audience who regard themselves as Friends of Australia to um, join Conservative Friends of Australia. It has a Twitter page uh, at CF Australia UK. Uh, and uh, you can, uh, you can uh, find the, the, the details to uh, affiliate yourself with Conservative Friends of Australia there. Uh, and perhaps you might uh, like to uh, come along uh, virtually next Monday evening as well. But Conservative Friends of Australia, I think, at a time when the relationship between our, our two countries, our two governments, our two sister political parties of government is so close, um, is uh, something that is well worth being associated with. Well, I shall certainly do my best to tune in. I'll, I'll, I'll also retweet that, um, those details after this, so any of the audience who follow me on Twitter can, can see that there. It falls to me at this point, almost exactly on the hour, to say, Thank you so much to George Brandis, the Australian High Commissioner, for being so generous with your time and your insights um, into the huge range of sometimes very sensitive topics that we've, we, we've touched on over the course of the past hour. Thank you also to uh, Thorncliffe, our, our sponsor, for, for making this event possible. Thank you to the audience, um, it turns out, from around the world for, for tuning in uh, this evening to the discussion. Um, and I'd also like to flag to you all that um, the Conservative Homes just announced its programme of fringe events alongside the Conservative Party Spring Conference taking place on Friday the 26th and Saturday the 27th of March. We've got a huge range of people um, uh, Robert Jenrick, Sajid Javid, Paul Scully, everything from the asylum system through to small business uh, and, uh, and taxes and every topic in between. So uh, do check those out on conservativehome.com. This has been Conservative Home Live. Thank you for all your questions and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.